first welcome on stage the founder of my muesli, Mats, Max Wittrock. Well, thanks for having me. We will have to practice the 566 quadrillion, uh, but let's, let's do that after the event, I would propose. So I would love to start with some market research. It's really simple. Please raise your hand if you've heard of my muesli before. Okay, that quota is okay, but who shopped at our Swedish website or in one of our Swedish stores? Okay, we have to work on that one, but I have still 20 minutes to go, so I'm quite confident that we'll make it. So, I'm Max. I'm one of the co-founders of a German startup that's called My Muesli. And the idea behind My Muesli is that you can custom mix your very own muesli from, as we heard, 566 quadrillion ingredients. And believe me, if you've never heard the story before, to everyone in Germany who heard it for the first time, it sounded just as ridiculous but it turned into a great company that I'm really kind of honored to have worked for for the last nine years, and we have more than 800 people at the moment. We operate 52 of our own stores across four countries. We deliver to six countries, but for today, I, w I was really wondering, because I think we can all agree on one thing, you probably know the Nordic or Swedish e-commerce market way better than I do, and a lot of you probably have far more e-commerce experience than I do. So, I think I'm, I'm not a professor and I'm not that good at teaching, so for the remaining 19 minutes, I would love to share with you what I've learned throughout the years, and maybe there's something you would agree or something you would say that you know, inspires you to do something different with your business. So, let's go back to the year 2007. Three guys in a small town in Paso, and as you can tell by their looks, really geeky, no money for haircuts, we, we weren't really into the dating game. Um, so, on a, because on a sexiness scale from one to 10, thinking about a muesli startup is like a zero minus three, and so we said, well, <laughs> let's focus all on one company. And our idea was, to start a muesli company. We were driving through the beautiful countryside at Passau. It's a very, very nice medieval town in Bavaria, and we heard a radio commercial from a German muesli manufacturer, and we said, well, no one has done premium muesli in Germany before. Why is that? It's such a, like, muesli is deeply inherited in the German DNA and in the Swiss DNA and the Austrian DNA, but we were lacking one thing, and that was money, and believe me, if this would would have been an investor's day, presenting to investors back then with the idea of custom mixing muesli online didn't really, you know, resemble too, too great. So we said, well, let's do it anyway. And in 2005, we heard the radio commercial, we planned, and on April 30th, we wanted to start. But before that, as university told us, let's do market research. So we sent out a survey to about 1,200 people asking them, would you buy muesli online? And we got a very encouraging response. Zero percent said that they would buy muesli online. <laughs> well, but as Mark Twain once said, you know, ignorance is really important, and you can quote Steve Jobs or Henry Ford, who said, as you probably know, if I would have asked people what they really wanted, they would have said faster horses. So we said, well, if Henry Ford can do it, then maybe three students from Paso can do it as well. Let's start the company, and let's take 3,500 euros and start mymuesli.com. I remember telling my mother, um, I went to law school and then went into journalism, I used to work for television, and working for television is kind of, it's a great deal when you, when you made it that far and you, you should be really happy. And I said to my mother, well, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit, I'm going to start a muesli company. And she, she almost kind of chased me out of the house, but um, luckily we did it anyway, and I'm really happy that we did. And this is what my muesli looks like. And I always, I love to speak at these marketing conferences where people only speak in hashtags and everyone goes, it's really disruptive and groundbreaking. And I would love to tell you that we came up with this packaging, which is a round tube, kind of similar to a Pringles tube, but 
reality is, and, and honestly, and I think that's quite crucial for every startup and every business, sometimes luck just finds you. And at this, this particular point, we wanted to have cool carton boxes, but no one wanted to manufacture carton boxes for us. So luckily, at one point, we find a manufacturer, a small family business who makes these tubes, and they say, well, if price isn't an issue, I mean, we can make 100 if you want to. We said, you're our man, let's do tubes. And that turned out to be quite cool because Honestly, the round packaging was really disrupting in terms of supermarket shelves across Europe. So it worked quite well, but I think lesson one, as a startup, sometimes luck just finds you. And this is what the website looks like at the moment, and the core of the website is still the muesli mixer. And it enables you to create your very own muesli mix. You can print a name on it, um, let's say Max's birthday. If you want to send me a birthday present, I'd be very humbled. Thank you very much. And um, I'll give you my address later on. And you can send me my personalized muesli. The good thing was that um, even though market research had showed that 0% were interested in customized muesli, that as you can see, our logistics were quite sophisticated from the beginning. So this is basically a fully automated warehouse. The robots are taking a break at the moment, but you can imagine them being there, and I would like to take you through it really quick. So this is the delivery area. It blends in seamlessly into the logistics area, and then, as you can see, there's a fully automated scale that produces the muesli. So um, we were quite, <laughs> well, afraid of journalists visiting our facility because all there was were 80 Tupperware things and a scale and a screen, and the screen was put up for television. There wasn't anything digital back then. But I didn't know if we would sell one box of muesli, but I was sure of one thing. People love to see other people fail, and everyone thought that this startup would fail desperately. So I knew that my former colleagues, my journalist friends, would write about the startup because people would love to see it fail. Luckily, it didn't. Within weeks, orders picked up and up and up. We gave interviews in our kitchen, and we were sold out after two weeks. Everyone thought, what a PR stunt. They pretend they're sold out. But honestly, we couldn't ship boxes for six weeks, so we put up a big magenta banner on our website saying, sold out. People kept ordering, orders piled up, and after six weeks, we were sending out, and they said, wow, great PR stunt. We said, well, again, Luck sometimes finds a startup. So we learned from our very first lesson, small operations require you know, small money. Now we had more money, so we could set up bigger operations. And we met a cameraman from South Africa who had just filmed the commercial for the Black Eyed Peas. That was in 2008. The credit crunch hit Europe. Um, and no one had spent money for TV advertising for months, no big company. So we asked the cameraman, who was one of the first guys to operate one of these slow motion cameras. Today you can film slow motion with an iPhone, but back then it was really challenging to do that. So we asked him, could you do slow motion for us as you did for the Black Eyed Peas in their video, let's get it started in here. And he said, well, guys, you probably can't afford me. But I live in Munich. If I'm ever in the area and you get all the equipment, the lights and everything, I'll film your very first TV commercial. So that's how we came up with the very first My Music TV commercial. It was finished for 2,900 euros. And it ran across German television for three years. It was ugly as hell, but it worked. So if I think it's really important to own one channel. And we, we did own online, but thanks to our sense for aesthetics and design, we were also able to come up with great offline solutions for presenting the product at fairs. And I would love to point out two things that really strike me as very innovative, and that's on the very right from, you can see the key features of the product really pointed out clearly so you can see them from the distance. But the most important thing about that particular booth was that we didn't check whether there was an internet connection available. There wasn't, so we had to print out the website in black and white, of course, so people could browse through it on the... P so, horrible. One year later, when y you might, of course, like no one in Sweden ever has weight problems, but Germans, when they turn 30, they realize they can't drink as much beer as they want to and they can't eat as bad as they're used to. So, as entrepreneurs, we wanted to open a salad bar in Passau, where we operated. We didn't get the rental contract, but we had already bought all the refrigerators, so what to do? Well, Philip, one of our co-founders, came up with the idea 
of opening a muesli store because we had all this great data. We could really tell if people liked strawberry muesli, if they kept ordering it. So with that data, we opened our very first My Muesli store in Paso. It didn't work for two years, but then, you know, we learned about offline marketing. We learned how to, you know, operate a store and we were able to open different ones. So this is one in Munich and then there's one in Stuttgart. We call this the winery. Taught me a very important lesson. Architectural renderings always look beautiful. But when you go into that particular store, you're afraid to take a tube out of the shelf. When you take out a tube, you, it's kind of difficult to put it back in, so you put it on the floor. You leave, but the, the person behind the counter can't get to you because there are so many other people. So like every two hours, you basically need to close down the store to clean up. Well, we did the same thing in Cologne, we did the same thing in Düsseldorf, but luckily at some point we realized that tubes should be standing in shelves. And so in our store in Switzerland, this is the second one that we opened in Switzerland, tubes are standing up again. And this is what the typical My Muesli store looks like. We have about 50 ready-made products curated by data, curated by our own nutritional scientists, and every hipster brand has to have a pop-up store. So this is our pop-up store in Zurich from last year. And we also applied the concept of mass customization because I think um, when, when you look at the My Muesli website, you, you're always tempted to ask, like, why? Like, what's happening in the store? Like, why can't I customize it in the store? In terms of logistics, it's really difficult, but in Heidelberg, um, if you're ever in the area, it's only about 3,000 kilometers from Stockholm, um, you should go to the Heidelberg store because there you can custom print your tube in the store with a very sophisticated 4D printing technique. And this is what it looks like at the moment. There are to-go mueslis, blah, 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 blah. But um, the problem was that every muesli was still produced the same way, like this. This is Tabea, she was back then, she was a literature student in her fourth semester, and she would literally count the raisins, like one, two, three. So in 2011, we really had to invest in our company, and, and again, we didn't have any investors, we had two business angels who didn't own close to 6% of the company, so we bought this, and this is the first fully automated muesli production machine in the world, and it can produce 566 quadrillion different muesli tubes um, fully automated. And I hope that in the first quarter of 2017, we will do great things with our packaging. Let's see if you can customize the packaging fully uh, together with the muesli, but that's still kind of future sound. And 2012, so one year later, supermarkets started approaching us, and I can still hear our marketing professors saying, don't talk to supermarkets, they're evil, don't. It will kill your premium brand, it will. But the German reality, more than 90% of Germans love going to supermarkets and on planet Berlin where I live, like of course we get food delivered to our home in like half hour windows, like late at night, but in Grievenbroich or Wesel, um, the beautiful German cities in Northern Westphalia, people love to go to supermarkets as all across Germany. So. We went into supermarkets and guess what? It didn't ruin our brand and it's really, really a very cool channel in addition to the two we're already operating. But as you are e-commerce retailers, you know that tracking people across these channels, of course, is difficult as hell and that is a challenge that we will have to solve for the years to come. So for the remaining seven minutes, let's talk about the why really quick because I don't want to be all teachy here, but um, when preparing for today, I thought, well, why would I buy this product? Or kind of why do people, why does this work? I mean, it's customized muesli, right? So um, I think that we all tend to over kind of kind of make things too difficult, like overcomplicate. So what we do at My Muesli, let's get this straight, we sell oats at a higher price than what we buy them for. That's the business model of My Muesli. And since when, when you go to conferences where people pay large amounts of money for tickets, you can also show slides like these. Well, it's a mass customization business model tournament between social commerce and Web 2.0. But that doesn't help you in any way. And I always love to do one exercise, and that is going back into the past. So if we would have founded this company in the 1950s, it would would have been about volume, like being allowed, because the customer is used to getting sold stuff from the left to the right. And 
That means, of course, and these are real magazine ads from back then, that you would have to compete with these guys. Like, they, they can afford babies. Like, let's imagine we would have founded My Muesli together in the 50s. We, of course, couldn't afford babies. Oh, man, Cola can afford babies, too. And if you have a baby on set, you also have to have a doctor. And, yeah, let's take the doctor as an ad as well. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. That's a real ad from the 1960s. So, what I'm referring to is, Without budget back then, no chance. Television did change a few things. You could, if you're Zlatan Ibrahimovic from Malmö, you could, of course, paint something across your body, run naked across the field, hug Zlatan, and then your brand would be on television, most probably. But that's kind of hard to do, right? And luckily for us as startups or e-commerce guys, and we, we tend to forget that the, e the internet changed everything. But what we're seeing at my Muesli is that the world gets more complicated every day and I tend to throw my smartphone into like any corner in the world like at least once a week when I am not able to answer what's app chats anymore or I, I don't want to. But we also see that the biggest channel for us or the most important channel is referrals. It's really about the net promoter score and you did hear about the net promoter score today as well. And I can't stress that enough, it's one of the most important metrics. Would I recommend my muesli to a friend? Am I happy with the product? Was it a good experience? And that's really what we're looking for. So d data and everything aside and, and, and metrics and, and uh, retention rates, the product has to be really, really awesome because it gives people a reason to talk about you. And the good thing with my muesli though is, um, and that is what we're aiming for when we're looking at new projects or investing into new projects, is the story of this product really baked into it, meaning um, does it spread? Because that's, that's basically the only thing um, I think you have to remember in e-commerce marketing. If it spreads, if it wins. If it doesn't spread, it doesn't win. If it's a shitty product, people won't buy it or they won't, won't show good retention rates. If it's a good product, people will buy it and they will rebuy it. And the eternal question that I ask myself every night is, of course, why do people dress their dog like a Jedi Master? Or why do they tattoo the Star Wars cast across their back? Or why, and I'm feeling that as a father, why do people dress their child as Darth Vader and dress themselves like the Death Star? What I'm referring to is, if referrals or the net promoter score is that important, how do you get these brand fans, like people that are really passionate about your brand, that are so passionate that they would dress like a Death Star. And why do people send us my muesli cakes? Why do professional archery associations use my muesli tubes instead of the Olympic archery things? And the answer is this, um, and this of course is self-explanatory, but I'll, st I'll explain it anyway. Um, the reason in Germany when you join one of these Trachten clubs is not because you like leather pants, but because the whole village does it. The reason why you drive a Prius is not because you like Japanese cars, it's because you want to show the world that you're caring for the environment. And the antagonistic principle works very well too. If you love Apple, then you most probably strongly dislike Microsoft. What I mean is that by buying a product, you're giving out a statement, and that is the reason people want to belong to a group, they want to show their antagonistic, or they want to imply that they're, you know, beyond the shopping experience. That is basic, those are the three reasons why people buy the product, and it's the exact same thing with my muesli. The people that are really loyal to our brand, they feel that they belong to a group, and that we have to foster. And I call it the age of the triangle, and I think a lot of brands do overlook that because in the 50s with Marlboro it used to be like this consumer consumer and if you've seen you've all be seen this these slides but it it's all changed and we, we keep forgetting about that getting lost in all of our metrics it's really about listening because I read an interview with um, one of the brand managers for Patek Philippe. And I'm not a watch guy, but I heard that they make quite expensive watches. So they introduced a limited edition that was close to 300,000 euros. And the journalist asked the guy the only kind of meaningful question at that point, why the fuck should I buy this watch? And the guy says, well, it's quite easy. Imagine you're sitting in the lobby of the ritz Carlton in Paris. You're wearing that watch. Another guy comes in wearing the exact same watch. You have a friend for life. 
And that was his answer. The difference is, in the 50s, that story would have stayed between those two. Nowadays, a brand can listen to that story, but still, we don't listen. Like, we have one guy sitting in the, base, in the social media basement doing Instagram, but I think it's, it's so impertinent, it's so important to do that, that it should, we should refocus and not look at metrics too much, but also think about why do people buy our product. And this experience that we have with product is really a new currency. And it doesn't have to be a mass customized product. It can be a cool emotional thing. Like, let's say we did a happy birthday video that we customized for all customers. And we went to an agency saying, how can we customize it for all of our customers? They said, well, we have to do CGI things. You have to hold up signs. I said, well, you don't do CGI for all of our customers? going to still one more minute. And we said, well, CGI is not the way to do it. And we did an algorithm search, and it showed us that with 61 versions of Happy Birthday, we could target 85% of our customers. So the marketing team had to sing for one day in the studio, but out came a beautiful personalized Happy Birthday video. And it, again, it doesn't have to be a personalized product. There are other ways of promoting your idea and really showing people why they should buy this product. And is it easy? No, it's the hardest thing to do ever. And I think what can go wrong will go wrong. Murphy's Law always applies. And people ask us about market size in the beginning. And don't ask yourself this question. Don't go into the, as we Germans say, analysis paralysis. Just listen to your customer. Why do they buy the product? And just do it. And if if there's one book or one video I would recommend, I would stop watching TED Talks altogether. There is only one thing to be learned from TED, I think. Now, of course, there are others, but... And I think the most important lesson I ever received was the one from David Blaine, who you can see in that picture. David Blaine is a magician from New York, and he's the world record holder in holding your breath. He can hold his breath for longer than 17 minutes, which he did in 2008 at the Oprah Winfrey Show. And the video is one of the most emotional and touching things I've ever watched in my life, as how he explains his decade-long journey of getting there. And I think we can learn three things from David Blaine as he explains in the end of the talk. Magic, and it's the same with e-commerce, takes three things. It takes practice, it takes a lot of technique, but it also takes hours and hours and hours of dedication, listening to your customers, but believe me, it's worth it. Thank you very much. But Go ahead. As you guys don't know the brand yet, there, of course, are two things you could do. You could either go to the website, mymuesli.se slash mueslimax, which is my personal affiliate page where I'm wearing a flamingo costume. It's worth watching. And second, we would love, since we have a booth set up with my um, two colleagues, Patrick and, and Stacy, who are sitting right, um, right there, but they won't to stand up, but you will see them um, <laughs> at the My Muesli booth, and for everyone who, who comes by, we will have a free sample available so you can try our product. Thanks. Thank you. A couple of questions from uh, the panel. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, you sold out in two weeks, you said, in the beginning, right? Yes. Yeah. So how did you get so much attention early? You mentioned some articles, but was that all? I Limiting the stock would be one answer, of course. You know, then it's, it's easy to get sold out. Well, but I think it's the, the, the short answer is that in, in 2007, 2008, that was e-commerce stone age and coming out with an idea of customizing food online where everyone else was looking at Facebook caught so much attention that in terms of PR and blogs, we really got a lot of coverage that led to sales that led to be sold out. I'm a bit afraid to ask because I think you're already over time, but I, I will do it anyways. In, in this crazy journey you've been on, because it's been fantastic, and thank you for the great presentation. What is the single biggest mistake that you've done and learned something from? The good thing about my muesli was, or about our story, that there wasn't one stone, you know, that was in front of us, and we said, fuck, what, what shall we do now? But there are tons of small ones, but um, I think it's, it's, it's easy to to repeat all these things like hire A people, not B people, blah, but you don't have money to pay A people in the beginning. It's all bullshit, I think. It's really about being really dedicated to the idea and not giving up when you feel like giving up. Jeremy, a quick question. Oh, I'm bad at quick questions. <laughs> um, what's the biggest uh, challenge moving into a new market? 
Well, I think it's, we, we think we live in a connected world, but in, in terms of like shopping behavior, food trends, um, even between Berlin and Sweden, which is a one hour flight distance, there are tremendous um, differences. And I think as a food retailer, adapting to these things is, is really, really tough. Um, but we're still learning, and since we plan to do it for, for the years to come, um, I will be glad to, you know, teach uh, or speak about this experience in 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. being old and all grey, and then I'll know the answer. When will you open a My Measly shop in Malmö? Well, I'm also, um, my good friend Slatan Ibrahimovic um, and I, um, we plan to open the Slatan Ibrahimovic My Muesli store <laughs> right across um, this building. It's going to be 1,000 square meters and it's going to open <laughs> third quarter of 2017. Oh, I'm looking forward yeah. to that. Thank you so much, Max, Thank you very much. for coming. Thank you. Bye.